thank you to Ashu, Grace, and Stephanie for you know, helping uh, Nenika get here across the pond <laughs> and up from Princeton as well. <laughs> so where she is currently on a year-long uh, fellowship. Yeah. Okay, so um, I just want to kind of thank you all for being here this afternoon and on a, on a Friday as I am sure it's, it's a difficult task to be here on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> but thank you very much for being here. And uh, when Zehra and I, Zehra Hashmi, my co-organizer for the series of uh, events that we are going to actually host at Brown, sponsored by the newly framed Saxena Center for India, you know, Contemporary South Asia, um, we, we, we wanted to kind of uh, engage, in a decision, uh, engage in a discussion on ethnographically studying the state, moving away from the abstract ideas of state function and state like, you know, capacity building in different parts of South Asia. We wanted to kind of turn the discussion towards a methodological dimension of how is it that we can think and conceive of the state. So in that regard, I think that Nenika Mathur, our, our distinguished guest here today, is one of the key thinkers and also anthropologists who's been essentially um, leading the way in ethnographically studying the state. I want to kind of, uh, I want to, um, you know, like, uh, extend, my, extend my thanks and for, for th thanks on behalf of Zehra and me. And I wanted to kind of also tell you all about the project that Nenika is currently working on and she's going to talk about with us today. Um, she has worked on these two beautiful books that uh, Paper Tiger, Law, Bureaucracy and Developmental State in Himalayan India, which I think was one of the key books which introduced us to ethnographically studying the state in South Asia. And secondly, I think a particularly more interesting book, which is Crooked Cats, Beastly Encounters in the Anthropocene, which talks about the bureaucracy dealing with capturing or like, you know, a de uh, of, uh, of big cats in mm -hmm. the Himalayan region. She's uh, currently working on two new projects. The first project explores the relationship between technology and government which builds upon her first book, Paper Tigers, and her abiding interest in bureaucracy, welfare, and the techniques of government in South Asia, but substantially extends it from moving into a study of utopia, technology, and intersection of techno technocracy and politics. The second project is centered upon asking what the climate crisis does to the production of knowledge in anthropology, specifically, and humanities and social sciences more broadly. And considering the, uh, the large number of students here who are interested in engaging seriously with the climate crisis and how this, the variety of authorities that deal with the climate crisis today think and conceptualize about it, I think we are going to, there is going to be an engaged conversation about this talk today over here. Thank you so much, Nanika, for sharing your work with us. Welcome. Thank you so much, Sangeeta, uh, for that really lovely introduction. And thank you to Zara and Sangeeta for, for inviting me here and the South Asia Center for hosting me. And a particular thanks to Grace and Stephanie for absolutely wonderfully, you know, making sure it was all very smooth um, and being really hospitable through it. Um, I should also say that, you know, I should have perhaps like listening to the series and listening to the kind of work that's happening uh, here over lunch on, on some of the things the grad students are working on, I think I should have perhaps talked about some of my earlier work, which is actually very much centered within the ethnography of the state in India. And that was part of my first book, Paper Tiger. Um, but perhaps a bit more selfishly today, I want to talk about my something I'm only beginning to work on, something that I really um, I'm interested in exploring further, and I would love to get your thoughts on that right now. Um, this, this, this talk today comes out of my recent book, which has just come out, Crooked Cats. Um, but it takes it further by thinking about method in anthropology, and it takes it further by asking what it means to produce academic knowledge in this moment in time, when we're all living in the climate emergency. Um, 
This talk today comes out of my long-standing research in a North Indian state called Uttarakhand, uh, which is largely a Himalayan state. Um, and my two books have been largely set in that region. But but some of the um, but this talk sort of also extends some of the concerns here. Now, uh, I'm going to very briefly talk about my book, Crooked Cats, because that sort of sets the stage for what I'll be talking about now. Now, Crooked Cats aims to retell the story of big cats that make prey of humans in India in light of the climate crisis. It makes a case for framing human, non-human relations against the backdrop of the climate crisis, and it uses the Anthropocene as an analytical frame to do so. I'm going to touch upon both how I understand the climate crisis and what I mean by the Anthropocene in my talk. Um, but the central question that is going to occupy this talk today is that of how academic writing, especially anthropology, can capture the reality of the unfolding climate crisis in the Indian Himalaya. This talk today is about how we write and talk of fraught times, how we discuss spaces that are becoming increasingly difficult to imagine into being, um, not just due to the complexity and pain for, you know, again, social scientists of all forms have powerfully written on such themes, but because they're unprecedented, unsettled, and profoundly uncertain. I want to ask what happens when the knowledge that one has produced is form in a form but rather is foundationally uncertain and it arises from a ground which is quite literally in the case of my own ethnographic site, slipping and sliding away. When it becomes clear that the entangled multiscalar realities of a planet in crisis cannot be adequately comprehended without establishing more robust conversations with un other knowledge forms, so not just with the arts and the humanities, but also with the natural sciences. Now, in my own recent work, Taking on board this radical uncertainty and doing this work of scale shifting, and in particular, a deeper engagement with other disciplines, including wildlife biology and climate science, has led to a re-seeing and a retelling of a more familiar story. It is this shift in perspective, such a take on the ethnographic project, that I wish to relate here today. So I will, in my talk, discuss the climate crisis and how it is making itself manifest in one part of India. I'm driven to do so through long-term engagement uh, with a very particular place in the Indian Himalaya that I'm going to be talking about today, a place that is changing rapidly and can no longer, I believe, be understood outside of the climate crisis. So if we center the Himalaya, if we think from it, so to say, and take seriously the conditions of life that currently exist, and the ever-present threat of death that permeates it, then what I ask here might an anthropology that writes in the Anthropocene consist of. So, um, now, I'm sure many um, the term to signify an epoch in which human actions are shaping the planet so profoundly that they're now acting as a geological force. Up on the slide, I have one paper from one of the people who's sort of uh, Paul Crutzen, who's um, attributed as having coined this term. Um, but of course, this is one version of what the Anthropocene is. There is a, just the term itself has generated a very fast and furious debate, and it won't be possible for me to dwell on this ever-expanding debate in detail today. But what I am going to do very quickly is lay out my take on it. So how do I understand the Anthropocene? Um, and why do I think it might be productive? And how might we use it in some ways? Let me begin with some of the criticisms of the Anthropocene concept. Uh, and actually, I find the cr criticisms very compelling. In my own early work, I was very critical of it myself. But something has changed, which has made me rethink the Anthropocene uh, and think that it might be a more productive frame to work through. But let's begin with the criticisms. So one of the big criticisms of the Anthropocene is that it originates in the natural sciences, which can lead to a domination by such a perspective. And it has the potential to eclipse out the humanities and the social sciences. That's one. Another sort of criticism of it is that it has the capacity to decenter the vital role played by both capital and by empire in the planetary crisis. And you know, other people have argued that there's an assumption that there is a singularity to the anthropos, to humanity, and this runs almost forcibly counter to the anthropological project of very carefully passing out who precisely it is we are talking about. 
And you know, of course, there's this whole other kind of criticism which is related to the commodification of the academy itself with its periodic and increasingly dizzying new turns, its concepts, its isms, and its scenes now. Um, and so, you know, for this and for many other reasons, I was quite critical of the concept of the Anthropocene in the beginning, and I didn't really take it seriously. Um, but then why am I coming back to it, and why am I now sort of thinking more deeply about what an anthropology for the Anthropocene might consist of? Sangeeta mentioned I'm in Princeton this year. I'm at the Institute for Advanced Study for a year, um, just starting a new project, which is trying to understand what the climate crisis does to knowledge making, and particularly what does it mean for the discipline of anthropology. Um, and as I said at the beginning, this, this paper today is, is an initial sort of version of what I think uh, this, this wider project might become. So my intention here today is not to try to convince any of you of the usefulness of the concept, uh, you know, in the way that, for instance, Bruno Latour did in his AAA presidential address back in 2014 where he argued that the Anthropocene is a gift to the discipline, nor is it my intention to spell out what an anthropology of the Anthropocene should consist of in the manner that someone like Amelia Moore has written of an Anthropocene anthropology or Anna Singh and her collaborators of the Apache Anthropocene. My thinking on the Anthropocene, of course, is very much in conversation with and is inspired by a very remarkable body of work that has emerged in the recent past, including some of the people I just mentioned. Um, but I want to particularly note here the critical scholarship on the Anthropocene that has, calls, has made calls for its creative remaking from a geological category to one that is attendant to the histories and politics of colonialism, capitalism, and industrialization. I'm drawn to what I consider a fundamental premise of the Anthropocene concept, that a radical new form of interdisciplinarity is the need of the R, and the comfortable disciplinary silos in which we have for perhaps too long sequestered ourselves are no longer tenable. Um, this, this body of work has variously made calls for indigenizing or decolonizing the Anthropocene. And um, so this is sort of one body of work that I'm sort of influenced by. In addition, there's a very vast scholarship um, from environmental history, political ecology, and environmental sociology. And this has a particularly rich presence in South Asia. Um, and in, in very important ways, this literature prefigures many of the more recent discussions on the Anthropocene. So what I'm going to be talking about today and what my work is sort of trying to bring together are these different kinds of perspectives together. Now, I'm, I, what I want to do is I want to draw upon this literature. And through this, I'm interested in crafting an ethical anthropological project that remains true to that which is folding in the Indian Himalaya. Um, as I said, this interest has sort of come quite organically out of my work in, in this particular state in India. In particular, I've been guided by two characteristics that I find striking, both of which I will elaborate upon today. And I should say that I've been working on Uttarakhand now for over 15 years. I started my patient in 2006, and I've been, I go back regularly, and I do field work there. And so much of what I'm talking about today is coming from seeing the kind of changes uh, in this space. Um, so the first thing that I find quite striking is there's this incessant talk of endings and the death of the Himalaya that emerge not just in relation to extreme events, but is also very much in evidence in everyday chatter. So you know, you'd be just sitting around and talking, and they'd be like, sab khatam ho raha, everything is finishing, and then there's a way in which there's a whole discourse around, um, around things finishing in the upper Himalaya that I find permeating everyday life in a way that it didn't say when I started my field work. Uh, back in 2006. Secondly and relatedly, I wish to center forms of storytelling that are narrated with regard to rapidly changing human-non-human relations. Um, and this again is something um, that you will hear a bit about in a, in a minute. Centering discussions of the dying Himalaya as well as stories of changing human-non-human relations has led me to quite profoundly reframe and rethink my own research and writing. Now, there's this whole, um, again, for any of you who's been sort of working on the Anthropocene or on environmental history or political ecology, you see that there's a whole new turn to storytelling, right? That we have to find new ways of telling stories. Um, and I, I sort of prefer the term beastly tales over stories, for that is a more precise description of the types of stories that 
I sort of am working through. These are about beasts of all forms. They're about tigers, leopards, humans, the state, capitalists, bureaucrats, hunters, poachers, bears, dogs, deer, gods, and demons. Um, but this phrasing is also play on the question of who is the real beast of the story, you know? And, um, and that's something that I want to sort of think through uh, ethnographically and historically. This phrase is, of course, borrowed with immense gratitude from the writer Vikram Seth, who has an utterly delightful collection of poems entitled Beastly Tales from Here and There. Um, this book, for I'm, I'm sure many of you have read it, but for those who haven't, it contains 10 animal tales, all in verse form. Uh, and there are all sorts of forms of morality tales resting upon unlikely animal relationships. Now, through an elaboration of beastly tales from the Indian Himalaya, I wish to make a case for an anthropology for the Anthropocene, by which I mean not just an academic practice that takes seriously this concept, but also which contributes to academic and public discussions on what it means to live in this epoch in which human activities are reshaping the planet we inhabit. So the Anthropocene in my reading names, questions, and hence undoes the received narrative of human mastery over nature. I see it running alongside conversations on the politics of academic knowledge production that are assuming different forms within Euro-American universities. So anthropologists have largely been conscious of whose voice we center in ethnographic work. Perhaps what we have been historically less attentive to is who gets to be heard, cited, considered authoritative, as producing that which we term quote unquote good anthropology and are then allowed into the warm embrace of the we that we refer to when we talk of us anthropologists as uh, Liana Chua and I have previously discussed um, in an edited collection called Who Are We? Rethinking um, Anthropology. So for me, these two projects aren't distinct. So on the one hand, you have something called the Anthropocene that names something particular about this moment as it interrogates and thus undoes human conceit of planetary mastery and the political econ economy of knowledge making as well as historical erasures of certain voices from within the academy. So in short, I see the Anthropocene as opening out vital questions on knowledge making. This includes how we frame our work and what role anthropogenic climate change plays in it, as well as what kinds of conversations can be established with the arts, humanities, and the natural sciences. How we write, what happens to the, that authorial voice when presented with a world that is shot through with existential uncertainty? What sorts of storytelling tools do we adopt? And who, whether interlocutors, peers, or colleagues from entirely different disciplines, we choose to center? Okay, so with this very long preamble, let us finally move to the Indian Himalaya where this work is set and from where many of these arguments emerge. I will be speaking largely of what is occurring in a small district called Chamoli, which has a long border with Tibet. Um, and as I said, I've been working in this area since 2006. Um, though of course, in more recent years, it's been a bit more difficult to return thanks to the pandemic and climate disasters and um, you know one's life and the work and, and sort of the temporalities of academic life. Now, the, the Upper Himalaya could be easily termed a climate frontier or an ecological hotspot, while in many places in the world, the temporal orientation for the climate crisis looks to the near future. In this region, that future is very much already present. As Kyle White has demonstrated through his work on indigenous perspectives from climate change, the present time for some is already dystopian. This region has for long functioned as a resource frontier with a long colonial history of extraction, from timber to minerals to the damming of rivers and the poaching of non-human animals. Interestingly, also in the mountains of Uttarakhand, the anticipatory work of climate adaptation or mitigation that is being undertaken by states and NGOs is still largely absent. So this makes it somewhat different from, say, the Sundarbans, the mangrove forests in India and Bangladesh, where significant investments are being made to reshape landscapes in response to climate change, with as a spate of uh, terrific recent ethnographic works are showing, mixed and unanticipated results. Instead, what we are witnessing up here is an accelerated process of destruction in the name of development. There are large hydropower dams, road expansion schemes, and other such mega infrastructural projects that take forward, if not greatly accelerate, the ecocidal logics of colonialism. The climate crisis is present in a variety of ways in this little Himalayan state. To wider publics, it would appear to flash up periodically through what are described as disasters. In particular, a disaster that unfolded near um, Kedarnath, um, in the temple of Kedarnath in June 2013, continues to haunt this region. 
This was in the language of climate science an extreme event. Following several days of unremitting monsoon rain and cloud bursts, flash floods inundated several regions of Uttarakhand. In addition to the uncharacteristically fierce monsoon behavior, a contributing factor to the floods was the moraine left behind by a retreating glacier. The monsoon rain filled the rock debris, reservoir of the moraine, and soon it overflowed to join the rising river. It was the combined force of the two that led to the raging flood waters. Officially, 6,054 people were declared dead, even though the unofficial accounts put the death toll uh, closer to 10,000. The flash floods that extended well into the plains affected millions of people, destroyed houses, bridges, and infrastructure, and stranded over 300,000 pilgrims and tourists in the mountains. In a region where one disaster or another now forms the norm on a seasonal, if not daily basis, this 2013 event is marked out as exceptional. Even in the otherwise prosaic bureaucratic language of the Indian state, it has been termed a devei apatta, or a divine disaster. The 2013 disaster was considered divine partly because of the scale of the destruction, which can only be wrecked by gods and demons. As eyewitnesses and residents of Uttarakhand describe and remember it, the floods and rains were of such ferocity that it could only ever have been retribution by nature. So the highest number of casualties and the greatest amount of damage took place in this town of Kedarnath, which is centered on an ancient Shiva temple, uh, apparently from the 8th century AD, and is um, considered holy by Hindus. Witnesses describe hearing a very huge snapping noise followed by a gigantic wall of water descending on the Kedarna temple and its surroundings. Miraculously, a huge boulder got logged behind the temple, protecting it from significant damage. The location of the temple and its strong construction also protected it. This protection was not at hand for the surrounding buildings that were swept away in the flood. So an image that has become iconic of the divine disaster was taken much further downstream from Kedarnath in the town of Rishikesh. In it, we see the flooding Ganges River partially submerging a popular Shiva idol. With his closed eyes and beatific smile, it is as if Shiva the destroyer is resting at the end of his dance of rage. So when I wrote of the divine disaster in the immediate aftermath of the event, I considered it a chilling foreshadowing of the Anthropocene yet unseen a world in which rivers, glaciers, mountains, clouds, humans, and gods would act with a hitherto unknown extremity, ferocity, and unpredictability. With time, however, it is clear that the divine disaster, or the Himalayan tsunami, as it is also referred to in the media, was not an isolated or even an exceptional event, the scale of its destruction notwithstanding. Rather, disasters are becoming, to use a word that I've used more for my research on bureaucracy, routinized. So again, just another example. Last year on February 7th, there was another disaster in the very same region. This was a smaller one in terms of human lives lost, but it had eerily similar visuals. I was then in Dehradun, the capital city of Uttarakhand, and my first inkling of the disaster was a WhatsApp forward from an old friend who lives in the region. In that video, one can see a deluge of water ripping through the valley. As the camera turned further down, turns further away, it blasted you can see the water is sort of blasting through a big dam there. And so in this video that he, this friend of mine sent me, you can hear someone saying in the background, almost with a flat calmness, it's all gone, everything is finished. Sab kuch khatam ho gaya. The flood trapped over 200 workers in an area called Tapovan who were working in a tunnel. Many of these young men were buried alive. Others were swept away by the flood. With cruel irony, the village that was most violently affected was none other than Reni the birthplace of the famed Chipko movement in the 1970s, of the 1970s, in which women protested the commercial felling of trees by hugging them, and which has led to the term tree hugger to be deployed to refer to environmentalists. There was much talk of the ghosts that had emerged from the disaster. These were the souls of those who had been trapped alive in a tunnel and had died waiting to be rescued. Similarly so of those, cop of those whose corpses were never recovered, other than perhaps a limb here or a scrap of cloth there, and hence they never received a proper funeral. Comparisons were made here with the ghosts that continue to haunt Kedarnath well after the 2013 disaster. So subsequent studies tell us that almost 27 million cubic meters of material was put into a minute-long descent that at one point was in complete free fall. 80% of this material was ice and 20% was water. A story in the BBC reported it thus, when the mass hit the Ronti Gard Valley flow, it released the energy equivalent to 15 Hiroshima atomic bombs. 
With the Chamoli disaster, there was a broader question among scientists, so amongst geomorphologists, glaciologists, etc., on whether a direct causation with climate change could be ascribed. The tentative suggestion from both a 50 author study in the journal Science, as well as an independent study by the Wadia Institute of Geology, is that there are linkages to climate change, though attribution would be harder. Both these studies recommend the installation of early warning systems in place. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've been working with these uh, glaciologists and geomorphologists and geologists uh, a bit, and it's fascinating for me to see the language of science that they take, or the questions of attribution that they take on, uh, you know, the things through which they talk about, is this climate change, is it not, what is happening over here? Um, and part of my project is to try to map these kind of knowledge-making practices onto other more traditional ethnographic material that one uh, that I've been you know sort of collecting in this area for a while. Now, so as such, both the disasters, so that's the Kidana disaster, the divine disaster, as well as the more recent Chamoli disaster, share an analytical repertoire. They're discussed as GLOFs, so as glacial lake overflows, um, avalanches, flash floods, in both cases, warming temperatures, melting glaciers, and the damming of rivers led, fed into the making of the disasters. Yet, in the scientific assessments that are undertaken after the disaster, there is a visible tussle of, with the question of whether what we are seeing are the effects of climate change, or is this simply the precarity of life in the upper Himalaya, a young, unstable, mountainous, and seismic zone that is still growing? Both disasters also share a reliance on satellite imagery to explain what really happened with, in the more recent case, swift analyses unfolding on Twitter. Now, these assessments, invaluable as they are, intersect as well as differ from an ethnographic account of the two disasters. For the majority of mountain persons, both the divine and the Chamoli disasters were foretold, not because, like for the scientists who reconstructed the event ex post facto, the seismic activity, crumbling mountainscapes, and glacial breaches were known, but because this was all of a piece with what they have for long been describing as the death of the Himalaya, a place in which all life forms, be they human or non-human, are either dying or they're assuming beastly new forms. In lieu of focusing on the specific and exceptional moments of the disaster unfolding, they focus on the difficulties of the everyday as well as on livelihood concerns. Now, I should note that when I refer to mountain persons, I'm speaking of people who identify overwhelmingly as belonging to the mountains or being Pahari. Most of them have lived here all their life. Uh, they work as street-level bureaucrats, as, subs as subsistence farmers, NGO workers, shopkeepers, journalists, the teachers, students living in the small towns of the district. And of course, this is a heterogeneous collective with some very important differences of subject positions and political opinions within it. However, for the sake of brevity, I'm glossing them here as, you know, as Paharis say this and mountain persons say this, but there are differences within them. But I would also argue that there is something very strong about this identity of belonging to the mountains and of actually living within this place in this moment of time that allows, I think, I hope, one to put forward a slightly more homogenized narrative like the one that I am going to uh, put forward today. Now, everyday life and livelihood are becoming increasingly difficult in the mountains of Uttarakhand, and one of the big sort of indications of this is the springing up of ghost villages, uh, or what are called Bhutiyagao, um, which are devoid of humans, um, and uh, basically everyone, so this is just one example of one uh, ghost village. It is estimated that anything between 1750 to 7,000 ghost villages exist in Uttarakhand. Um, and this is something, again, that I've seen a lot myself over the last 15, 16 years, where villages where I've gone and done field work in, they're actually empty. I'll go back there and they would have, there'd be no one left there other than maybe a few people or they've become bhutia. They've actually literally become inhabited by ghosts in that sense. Um, and when you go and sort of see what's happening here, you can see these very clear patterns uh, where the depopulation of the Himalaya and its relationship to poverty, unemployment, and the climate crisis is quite clear, but I think it's not been studied perhaps as deeply as it should be. Um, but the point I want to make here really is that what happened with the Chamoli disaster on 7th February 2021 or on June 16, 2013 with the divine disaster isn't divorced from the texture of everyday life, which is like the village of Reni that I just discussed before, headed for oblivion. So the strongest indication of the climate crisis in the Himalaya for many of its residents isn't necessarily in these big disasters that I've just touched upon. Rather, it is to be found in more mundane things, like the disappearance of the forests, rains that don't come on time, 
rivers that are no longer as full as they used to be, in the intense heat, and in animals that are misbehaving. Um, and that is and it's these beasts that I will now turn to. And this is, uh, this is in a way where, um, this is what I talk about in, in my book, Crooked Cats, as well. Now, the increasingly brazen behavior of big cats, which are leopards or tigers, has been a noticeable change in the upper Himalaya. Leopards, which in the latest leopard census of 2018, put us counting approximately 839 on Uttarakhand and approximately 13,000 in India as a whole, in particular discussed as misbehaved, as cheeky, and as crooked beings. They're being cited in human-dominated landscapes, including big cities. They're increasingly losing fear of humans and aren't afraid to reveal themselves in broad daylight. They're attacking pet dogs and livestock, and most worryingly, are increasingly making prey of humans themselves. Um, such big cats are popularly known as man-eaters, and of course they have a very long history in India. However, across the board in the mountains, I was told that there is a spike in attacks by big cats. I take seriously the universal claim among my interlocutors in the Himalaya that big cats are acting in ways that are increasingly considered out of character. It is worth noting that more recent state statistics also show an upward trend in attacks by leopards on humans in Uttarakhand. But there is no reliable way to chart out the predatory behavior of big cats and the reported upswings in it over the long durée. My project here and in the wider work that this talk is drawn from is not to convince anyone of the veracity of these claims of crooked cats in the Himalaya or even demonstrate any causality with the climate crisis. Rather, it is to take these claims of increasing crookedness seriously by exploring the lived reality of what it is to share space with potentially predatory non-humans, and by asking what these beastly tales of crooked cats might be telling us. Now, most big cats, tigers, lions, leopards, are simple or straightforward. They're considered sidha hasadat, in the sense that they respect humans and are careful to avoid any unpleasant encounters with them. Yet, there are some specific big cats who have become crooked, or they become teda, uh, and this is how they were sort of described to me. These are big cats that have gone off the straightforward path and are actively seeking out humans to make prey of them. Now, this begs the question of why do some big cats go crooked? And there are several theories that proliferate to explain this. Some refer to the idiosyncrasies of individual big cats, some to the bad karma or the misfortune of human victims themselves. However, the most dominant account of why big cats go crooked do so with reference to power, inequality, and human actions. Big cats themselves are described as more or less innocent. Rather, it is a specific type of human and the political economic structures that they've assembled over time that have brought us to this pass. A sympathetic stance toward, uh, towards crooked cats was discern discernible once they had been killed or captured, that is, with elaborate theories propounded to explain why they do what they do. Now, I want to pause for a moment to reflect on the manner in which beastly tales on crooked cats are related. The highly speculative in nature, they proceed on a case-by-case -case basis, and they leave space for forms of uncertainty. Even as they trace complex connections across time, space, individual species, and politics, these accounts do not demur from accepting uncertainty at the heart of the tale. It is this uncertainty on crooked cats that leads to the dense proliferation of beastly tales on them, which squares with my understanding of the Anthropocene as a condition that is foundationally uncertain and unsure, a moment in time when our knowledge-making practices need to adapt in order to take on board these unknowns. One of the ways to do so, though, my, though by no means the only mode, is to craft new storytelling tools that allow for translation across domains that are too often kept separate from one another. Okay, so to return to theories on why certain big cats go crooked, a prominent account centered human violence against big cats. A large amount of killing and poaching of leopards and tigers has made them as a species and as individuals with particular biographies angry with humans. Thus, the many crooked cats that exist are nothing but the kin of the hunted, mutilated, and poached big cats who are seeking revenge on humans. This revenge is extracted by making prey of humans in the very same way that humans preyed on their ancestors or relatives. Incre interestingly, studies on North American cougars have indicated that the hunting of them leads to an increase in conflict between humans and big cats. So there is a generalized belief in the Himalaya too that the more you kill and hunt tigers and leopards, the more they will retaliate in kind. 
So Uttarakhand has a very high incidence of attacks by leopards, one of the highest in India. And this is often explained by reference to the long border the state shares with Nepal and Tibet, both places where poached animal parts are smuggled out to from India. The culpability of place, the practice of intense hunting, poaching, as well as the translocation of leopards, categorized as problem animals, were brought up as reasons that some individuals from this feline species are targeting humans. Equally, non-human animals seek retributive justice from specific individuals for the very particular actions, whatever those may be. So several stories of individualized retribution were related. For instance, there was famously a crooked leopardess who only hunted inebriated men because her own parent had been shot by one such man, or the story of a leopard that limped a little and was seeking revenge on the woman who had accidentally hurt him with a sickle in the farm when he was a cub. The limp and the individualized retribution reminds one, of course, of probably the most famous crooked cat of all, the tiger Sher Khan of Jungle Book fame. Another popular theory on why there's so many crooked cats in the Himalaya refer to the lack of indigeneity. These beasts are alien to the mountains and their true provenance is located in the plains. When leopards grow old in the zoos in the plains, plains people send them up to the mountains to die. Or when zoos get overcrowded with leopards, then too, they ship them up to the mountains. As these zoo leopards are used to being provided with meals and some are in any case too old to hunt wild animals, they turn on the easiest prey of all, humans. As more and more rescue and rehabilitation centers for big cats are set up in India, the issue of overcrowding has extended to these spaces as well. But the belief that captured or zoo-accustomed big cats are sent up from the plains to the mountains has to be understood in the context of a historical mountains plain animosity that dominates the politics of this impoverished borderland region. The release of old leopards and tigers from zoos into what plains people merely consider the jungle, with no heat paid as usual to the peril that this poses for its inhabitants, is considered just another item in a long list of actions by plains people that combine abuse and neglect of the mountain people. Now, there's a variant of this release from the zoo explanation for man eaters that also has some traction in Uttarakhand. In this version, alien leopards have not merely been released from zoos or rescue centers and neglectfully sent up to the mountains. Rather, these man eaters have been sent up with an actively malign intent to kill and destroy mountain people. The conspiratorial element in this explanation is explicit. There's a very similar discourse that is present in the neighboring Himalayan state of Himachal Pradesh, where several people told me straight out that crooked cats are objects of extermination controlled by the state. Similarly, many residents around the Sanjay Gandhi National Park in Mumbai believe that in the evening, the park authorities open the gates and leopards come out of the park to hunt and eat whoever they can find, from pet dogs to humans. So in studies of human-animal conflict around the world, such an intentionality behind the appearance of dangerous animals is often assumed, with most often the state being accused of a conspiracy to murder. Now, there's also the question of who the target of crooked cats are. Such beasts are believed across time and space to actively seek out certain categories of persons to prey on even while they leave others untouched. So the ones who are most likely to be targeted tend to belong to minority or vulnerable communities. These are refugees, lower caste people, mountain persons, Adivasis, the poor, women. As Anu Jale has also noted from her work in the Sundarbans, there are complex political and socioeconomic reasons that make certain humans more likely to be victimized by crooked cats. These reasons run along axes of class, caste, gender, race, age, location, and nationality. Thus, crooked cats and the depredations allow for a bloodied mirroring of the wider inequalities of the world. Now, it is quite clear to almost everyone that a lack of alternative prey or the disappearance of the regular prey base of big cats are making them increasingly desperate, hungry, and predatory. This paucity of food was put into the language of climate change as evidenced in extinction, biodiversity loss, degradation, but largely by local elites such as bureaucrats and NGO workers. Similar narratives on climate change causing what is referred to as human-wildlife conflict is put forth by wildlife writers, international conservation organizations, scientists, and the international media alike. So while my interlocutors in the mountains certainly made reference to the visible ecological degradation all around, and they particularly mentioned the vanishing of more regular prey as a major reason that leopards and tigers are becoming increasingly ravenous, there were different sorts of stories told, and the English language word climate change was rarely deployed. 
Indeed, climate change was largely only used by agents of the state and conservation NGOs to in fact take ac attention away from human action and rather operated as a tool of depoliticization. There was a shrugging of the shoulders and, it ref and this reference to something much bigger than what one can control. You know, it's just climate change after all. Um, this attests to the need to remain attentive to the power of this concept to invisibilize precisely that which it needs to center. This also opens up the question of whether you need to speak in the language of climate change or the Anthropocene to be speaking of the processes that cause it. Uh, Ritodi Chakravarti and Pasang Sherpa similarly report from the fieldwork in the same region of the Himalaya, where a woman exasperately asked them, but why are you so interested in the climate? The climate is not what oppresses us. This is a quote from their interview. Indeed, while not deploying the same language or words, the varied explanations for the increasing presence of crooked cats by long-term residents of the Himalaya carry nested stories and dense analyses within them. They're rooted in longer histories of resource extraction, the violence of the state and capital alike, and they're attentive to the manners in which class, caste, gender come to matter in such moments of time. Now, the debate here isn't over whether causality can be established with climate change or what technical inputs can be added to fix this, but it is a different way to tell a story of human destruction. If you read all these varying theories on, big cat crook and on why big cats become crooked together, we can see how human acts, hunting, translocation, actions undertaken in the distant past, merge with cosmology centered on reincarnation and retribution. At the same time, the role of the state and the use of political power, which comes across particularly strongly in the so-called conspiracy theories, are considered critical. History isn't separate from politics and religion, and there are complex interconnections that are constantly made by varied actors. This is, to my mind, the Anthropocene, that capacity of human actions to have such a huge impact that we are leaving a destructive human signature on the planet at work. This is an evidence through a coming together of empire, capital, ecology, the state, notions of karma and reincarnation, and the conceit of certain types of humans. So what I'm making a case for here is for understanding beastly tales as expressing powerful truths about the Anthropocene, as carrying what Alison Ford and Kari Norgard have, turned, have termed environmental subjectivities. Ford and Norgard draw upon the work of black feminist scholars and deploy Audre Lorde's concept of the mythical norm to center culturally specific climate knowledges, including those who, quote, frame climate change as symptoms of unsustainable political economic structures, end of quote. Now, some of you, you know, people here work on, some of you work on South Asia, you might remember that, you know, there was this extreme heat wave that we were sort of experiencing in India and Pakistan in the summer where birds were quite literally falling from the skies. Now, accounts of what heat is doing to non-human animals in the Himalaya have been central absolutely from literally the first day since I started my research there. So bears, I was told in particular, had been maddened by the heat in the Himalaya, um, and they had started acting in ways that were not explicable. They were ruining houses and farms, they were wantonly attacking humans. So recently, the Uttarakhand police had put up a Facebook post to explain robberies of food and grain from locked houses in the district. And they said that this had been undertaken by bears. Um, you know, and this became the stuff of much hilarity and the police had to delete the post. But you know, I remember seeing this, uh, this sort of on social media and everyone laughing at the police and saying, oh, look at them talking about these thieving bears. And I didn't actually find it funny because the reality of crafty, scheming, thieving animals, whether these are leopards or bears, are absolutely central to this landscape. These non-humans go crooked, they thieve, they act in ways that constitute a radical break from the characters due to the slow but sure death of the Himalaya. But you know, the question that when we would sort of discuss it, people would be like, but how else are they to behave given what the real beasts, which is humans, have done to the Himalaya, given that they, like us humans, also have to feed themselves and the families and forge ways to live in a dying landscape. Furthermore, you know, elements like these bears were not separated out from the must deer that had gone extinct due to, despite the existence of a must deer sanctuary for them. Um, the must deer, we were told by state accounts, were dying off because of the intense heat in the Himalaya. But mountain people were convinced that this ending came from poaching, hunting, and more crucially, an uncaring, neglectful state that cared to only have sanctuaries on paper, but didn't do the work required for it to be a meaningful reality. 
I could go on and on with these beastly tales, but we're sort of running out of time. Uh, you know, for instance, I've not even mentioned the forest fires that are adding to that which is burning down the Himalaya. But let me here try to summarize what I'm arguing. Um, and perhaps a short contrast between my take on the Anthropocene and where one might see climate change, even when it is not so labeled, and another account that has gained popular traction might be instructive. In a prominent intervention, the novelist Amitav Ghosh, who happens to hold a DPhil in anthropology, has railed against what he considers an astonishing failure to grasp the urgency of climate change. In his important 2016 book, The Great Derangement, Climate Change in the Unthinkable, Ghosh notes that although, although South Asia is, quote, extraordinarily vulnerable to climate change, and India is a country that is highly politicized with great, amount, great amounts of indignation and outrage expressed on a wide range of issues, yet, he, he says, climate change has not resulted in an outpouring of passion in the country. Instead, he goes on to write, and I'm quoting him, quote, political energy in South Asia has increasingly come to be focused on issues that relate in one way or another to questions of identity, religion, caste, ethnicity, language, gender rights, and so on, end of quote. Now, my argument runs counter to Amitav Ghosh's. As I see it, questions of identity, as well as expressions of indignation and outrage on other political, but not directly ecological or climatic issues should be folded into discussions of the Anthropocene. As noted at the very outset of this talk, one of the early critiques of the Anthropocene was its capacity to flatten out precisely such issues of inequalities and different subject positions within the Anthropos. In my reading, criticism of and a profound awareness of climate change abounds in the political. Those seemingly absurd narratives described here, big cats being shipped up to eat the natives or big cats turning on humans for the purpose of retributive justice, can and ought to be seen as angry commentaries on the wider politics and practices underpinning anthropogenic climate change. This, of course, enables us to open out the question of how climate change is anthropogenic to see the Anthropocene in these narratives on human actions and culpabilities, in these beastly tales that are so easily dismissed or not even heard, rather than in graphs, um, IPCC reports, media articles, or other forms of knowledges that are typically used to describe this planetary crisis. As an ethnographer, I contend the unthinkability of the impending climate crisis that Ghosh finds in fiction. Perhaps the politicization that he's referring to are, for instance, the politics of hate and division of the ruling party in India right now, the Bharatiya Janata Party. This is a different order of the political from the many struggles that we're seeing across South Asia or from the quotidian chatter of residents of the Himalaya in which I discern several prescient accounts of the past, present, and future of human as well as non-human animals, like the endangered tiger and leopard. What these beastly tales depict are our naughty interspecies entanglements in the Anthropocene. A failure of the imagination is evident not as Ghosh despairs in the deep politicization of the world to the exclusion of an ecological focus. Rather, it lies in our inability to read these commentaries as intrinsically critical of the processes that cause and sustain global warming in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Uh, do you like uh, these questions yourself? Or? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So it was a lot in there. <laughs> it's like speeding through so much. Okay. Should I start off? Okay. Okay. Hi, thank Hi. you, Nanika, for that fantastic talk. And actually, like, you know, while listening to this uh, discussion of, uh, you know, the crooked cats and the, you know, the teda, teda janwar, essentially, I was wondering, like, you know, and this is something that we talked about at lunch as well. So I was wondering the ways in which the the kind of like bureaucracies, as you are well mm -hmm. aware of, the, the bureaucrats within these institutions are actually kind of uh, making sense of these like, you know, ideations and concepts that are floating in the common popular knowledge. Right. 
Yeah, thanks, um, Sangeeta. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's very interesting because, um, you know, we also discussed the film Sherni over lunch, yeah. and there is a way in which one can't really understand or think about uh, about non-human animals and the lives they have and the way that they try to be conserved or protected or governed or killed without understanding this everyday life of bureaucracy or the ways in which conservation laws uh, work through these bureaucratic institutions and the ways in which um, lower level street bureaucrats themselves understand what's happening or the ways they act on it. Um, so actually in the book I have three sections which is really on the governance of non-humans about how you identify them, how you come to know them, how you petition against them, how you govern them. And I think that that uh, aspect of the governance of the state, of governing these non-human beasts is absolutely cent central to also trying to understand the climate crisis. That we can't actually think about this everyday life of bureaucracy as distinct from th this bigger planetary crisis, the ways in which that is feeding into, um, and you know, and vice versa. It's, it's, it's part of this, um, the social world, so to say. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, it's really interesting to like, uh, again, while we were talking with lunch, I was really thinking that it would be impossible for me have to, to have written this book, or even actually made this argument about big cats had I not already done that uh, work on ethnography of bureaucracy. Because there is a way, I, I thought this was a completely different project and I was not going to go down that and, you know, it's a new thing I'm going to think about. And actually I found it impossible. I kept coming back to, for instance, the space of law and the ways in which non-human animals are constructed legally or the kind of uh, protection measures that you have there or the kind of not necessarily protectionist measures, but other ways in which they imagine within the space of law or within very dry sort of bureaucratic documents um, on political speeches or, um, or you know, just the visuals of them that you see in these spaces and, and they come to be part of it. So, yeah, no, absolutely. That's a really important part of the story, which I didn't talk about here today because here I'm trying to more think about the question of method, think about, you know, how, how do we relate these different kinds of stories to something as big as the climate crisis and Anthropocene, trying to make a case for seeing the climate crisis perhaps in places and in stories and events that uh, we might not necessarily see them in. Um, and I'm sorry, just a quick question. Yeah, that. Like, in the sense that it, I think that, that these bureaucracies are particularly interesting places to you know, study these, these events, like you know, the in, events of the Anthropocene, particularly mm -hmm. because you can see the juxtaposition between the two different knowledge systems, right? right. So like, when exactly. they are essentially yeah. kind of interacting with the, you know, the Teda Janwar, they yeah. are also having to like file these like really boring reports and... Exactly, so, yeah. So like why does that kind of like intersection essentially exist yeah. and like how does that kind of talk, like help us think about the climate crisis that we yeah. have on our hands essentially. Yeah, 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 no absolutely. And I mean, you know, there's also something so interesting in that clashing of discourses, right? Like you have these like dry bureaucratic forms, you have these files, you have these licenses, you have these IDs, you have these petitions. I mean, the petitions are quite affective and emotional because they're not written by bureaucrats. But you have these like sort of very banal everyday forms of knowledges. And then you have uh, this, this perplexing non-human beast, right, who's there. And the way they sort of try to be disciplined in these documents is also something that's fascinating. But I'm also getting increasingly interested with why out. Um, and so, you know, I feel like, including in my own work, I feel like there's a lot that I left out of that frame. And why did I do that? You know, and is it because uh, of a particular way that we are trained as, um, as social scientists, as ethnographers, um, is it the ways in which disciplines operate that you see that but you don't see that? Or is it that there is something in the climate crisis that is invisibilized, that we find hard to get at? You know? And this is why I think this push for different forms of writing, different kinds of stories is really important. Um, because I do think we need to change the way in which, uh, I mean, I, at least I do, uh, maybe not, you know, maybe not all of you, uh, you know, the ways, the, the, what we keep in the frame and how we, how we sort of shift scale and how we talk about um, everyday life, you know, like, uh, and I, I don't think that I'm doing justice to what's happening in, in the Upper Himalaya if I do not center the climate crisis, because it's just there. But perhaps I just didn't have the tools as an ethnographer to, to write it in.
Hi, thank Hi. you so much. This was um, really interesting. And although I like know nothing about the region, basically, <laughs> but uh, as uh, I'm really struck by uh, the methodology and um, a new expression of multi-scalar rea scalar realities and shifting scales. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm one, like, I'd like to hear more from you about that because technically, in my head, it's a scale is something replicable. Right. That it stays the same, but right, gets bigger, right, right. stays the same and gets smaller. And methodologically uh, or ethnographically, how do we shift scales without yeah. reproducing the same neatness of that the climate crisis is unfolding differently? But right. It's similar at the same time, like to do that very neat narrative that what happens to like distortion if yeah. you change scale too much yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and how do you keep that in, yeah in that's a great right. question that's a great question yeah thanks thanks for that you know I mean I think this is exactly right because when we thought of scale earlier it was like you scale up and you know the same thing is replicated at another scale um, there is this again big discussion the whole Anthropocene literature on what is scale how do we use it you know um, what does it mean to shift scale, etc. Uh, perhaps I can talk about how I'm using it, and this is partly inspired by the work of Anna Singh's uh, work. Yeah, I mean, of course, because I think she, like, I think the most interesting thing she does in her book on mushrooms, um, the mushroom book, as I think of it, is that she shifts scale really well. So she she's able to uh, talk about mushrooms. She's able to talk about. Um, capital, she's able to talk about ecology, she's through quite a creative form of writing. Um, so let me explain what I mean by when I say I'm shifting, we need to shift scales here. And I'll give a specific example. Um, so I'm using scale shifting not to talk about replicability, I'm, I'm using scale shifting to talk about understanding the local, the regional, the national, the sub-regional, or whatever you have to the global, as all uh, enmeshed within a similar kind of uh, uh, what we're calling the climate crisis. And I'm making an argument, I think uh, what I'm interested in doing rather than my own project is trying to understand how something that is as bizarre as say bears which are thieving, thieving bears, what do they tell us about the planetary crisis? And how do we shift that scale from that very um, almost, you know, exotic, like incident of this bear comes into these people's house and steals things, or this big cat that has gone crooked and is attacking humans, that kind of jungle booky, you know, Kiplingesque imagination. How do we move from that, I mean, that problematic colonial imagination to, um, to the, its ethnographic, or its empirical reality in the mountains right now, and we are able to then write in different kinds of scales. By, and by scales, I mean like the local politics, but national politics, regional politics, history, um, senses of time, uh, the global, so to say, or the planetary rather, uh, into this. Um, and I don't think I've done it very well here or even in my book. And this is something I really want to think about methodologically. That I feel that, you know, a part of the challenge of understanding the climate crisis is it's so big, right? Like there's something like, uh, like a planet that is in crisis that, and it's happening everywhere, it's global warming. But how do we understand something that's so big through, not its local manifestations and climate disasters, but through more sort of mundane, everyday, political, economic, social processes? How, how do we read that into it? That's the kind of scale shifting I'm thinking of. Um, but again, like, you know, um, that's a really good question. And that's something that I really, I'm actually genuinely going to be working on this year. Is this, is this question of how, how do we do this scale shifting, but also what exactly do we mean by scale? And I'm, I'm using a rough and ready idea of not of replicability, but of different scales um, in relation to one another and us finding the tools through which we're able to read them together and not as distinct. So not saying that this is this bizarre thing that's happening in, in this district here, and this has nothing to do with everything else that's happening nationally or, or what that has happened 150 years back with empire or that's happening with finance capital at this moment, but being able to read them together, um, if, if that makes sense. Zara and then, yeah, yeah, oh, sorry, and then, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I, yeah, my actually, so my question is following up on my yeah. little scale question because I'm curious about um, how the people you're working with are mm. also playing with scales yes. because you had 
just description of you know the bureaucrats or people who are in uh, agents of the state essentially mm. saying oh it's climate change mm. whereas people who are affected by it ordinary mountain people Not are necessarily yeah yeah talking about it yeah. being a conspiracy and i think yeah. i really liked your um description of uh, who's the beast because i think that's so much more of a right. creative way than asking like who's the agent of this right. or who is responsible uh, but in a way in that playing of scale right. in saying it's climate change yeah. they're shifting scale right. away from a kind of localized responsibility mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is of course both are true mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. as you're saying so i'm wondering how people are kind of doing that yeah um that's part one of the yeah. question and then yeah. part two is is this is a selfish one because i like thinking about individuals and when they appear mm-hmm. and so thinking of you know the individualizing mm-hmm. of these specific animals that's yeah. happening and the bureaucratic processes attached to that yeah what what is that i mean what is that about like yeah. why why yeah, is that yeah. happening do you think yeah. and is it part of this attempt to kind of get a hold on on this kind of irreconcilable um unwieldy un, uh, sort of out of scale problem mm, right. uh, to kind of track down and individualize right right um, right right yeah yeah um thanks there are great questions i'll combine them actually in a way because you know funny with this sort of linked so the individualizing let me begin with that because i was also fascinated by that and um in in the book what i have is like after every two chapters i have a beastly biography where i talk about an individual leopard or individual tiger and i try to like right about the life because i'm fascinated by exactly as, as you picked up on the individualization mm-hmm. of a particular tiger often they're named but they're not always named but they have personalities uh, not just tigers but leopards lions etc they have histories their biographies they have stories about them um and they're highly individualized in the stories um often and very often through some form of naming practice saying that you know that one or um even if it'll just be like you know the 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 one who comes from this village uh, mm-hmm. or like they would give them some sort of a pet name like you know um yeah i mean there were also some names that they have which are also fascinating and though that's another story almost and i i wondered about this so partly i think it is this tendency to anthropomorphize mm-hmm. um but i think partly it comes from something which is the wider question i was interested in which is that they say you know the base question is that most big cats do not become crooked there are only some that go crooked and the question is why do they become crooked and in this answering of this question of why only some or that particular individual has gone crooked i think to me opens out much bigger questions that i then frame through the anthropocene uh-huh. narrative like i think it opens out this thing of why is that happening so in my interviews i would go and say you know why do you think this is happening uh, so on this question of you know link to your second your first question on scale or scale shifting and they'd be like and i found the i found the responses fascinating and in a way that is what led me to write this book and to actually think about this current project they would begin by so suppose there was a a crooked cat in a village and it has picked up a child and gone off you go there they're like angry they're furious the one that leopard killed immediately the one that tortured the one you know some sort of red, like direct retribution the very angry at the state uh, for like allowing this to happen and for protecting big cats more than they protect humans etc but then if you keep going back as i have been doing for all these years and you talk to them more there are very different kinds of stories that then come out and actually very interesting different scales of of understanding right so most of them will not use the term climate change but they will talk about ecological collapse like mm-hmm. without turning terming at that they will talk about corruption mm-hmm. there is a lot of discourse on corruption of the state mm-hmm. and you know to go back to your question sangeeta on like what the everyday state is and what is that doing there about corruption of the state corruption of politics mm-hmm. the defilement of the state mm-hmm. um there is also reference to like big capital and the, and where they will name particular kinds of industrialist a particular corporate houses say look you know jp is going to build that big dam over there and look at adani is doing this etc so this way in which again to go back to the thing of individualization um there are these very dense narratives that come out there and mm. for me i think it is on those dense narratives around this straightforward question of why is this individual cat acting the way it is like why do you think they're doing that that the scale shifting is happening for them so on the one hand it is about the local it is about you know uh, the 
someone's put an evil spell on them or someone did some bad mm. karma or something it is also about the state politics of you know the the bjp or the congress is in power and they're doing this and they're so corrupt and they have done that and then there was there's also reference actually very interestingly to the british and to mm-hmm. empire and also so ways ki angrezo ke time se chal raha hai and you know there's a reference also to time so i think in those narratives we can tease out that kind of scale shifting mm-hmm. happening uh a spatial scale shifting but also a temporal one mm-hmm. uh, with reference back but this all, and they also talk a lot about the future but you know just wait and see this is why my current project is called the death of the himalaya mm. um rethinking method in the climate crisis because this is constant thing of you wait and see you know when you come back next year this will be gone that will be dead and that that leopard would have eaten us all up it would have done this it would have done that so mm. th- there are these moment in time and in attributing responsibility to different kinds of agents within within uh, mm. these stories now again you know this is a question which you again as an ethnographer might like sometimes face i i felt it always with my work is it that i'm hearing this because i want to hear it right mm-hmm. like these are the ways i am interpreting it this is my subjective reading of it someone else might go there and do the same interviews and not come away with that mm. um and maybe that is the case like maybe i am so obsessed with climate change that i'm hearing it but i would like to think not i would like to think i would like to think that i am i've been led here through this ethnographic um and you know long term ethnographic work now um rather than the other way around yeah mm-hmm. yeah so sorry very complicated like complex like a mixed up answer to your two very good questions on yeah. on on individualization scale thanks yeah so um i'll also follow up on the scales yeah. question but add kind of the institutional scales mm-hmm. that um so kind of brings your previous mm-hmm. work and this work together and um and just wanted to know get get a sense of how you know when you st- went up and down kind of the bureaucratic mm-hmm. scales right. um yeah. how did the the valence or or the the conceptualization you you alluded to some of that yeah. but i'm also thinking in a very literal way when we think of the ministry of environment and forests mm, which in right. 2014 became the ministry of environment forests and, and climate, climate change, change. Yeah. it was kind of just yeah. added on yeah. and and that's kind of almost it's it's uh, it almost like it's a literal sense mm. of how when you go up the scale there's this kind of the conceptualization becomes broader and yeah. there's this kind of and in the new current work around kind of the ethical um underpinnings of of bureaucracy it also like you're able to do that at that scale right. but and then at the very local it's about managing you know that particular compensation exactly. of a family that's been attacked yeah. by a yeah. um you know Absolutely. by a leopard yeah. or you know a forest fire that has to be has to be put out so sort of yeah. how do these kind of nested scales of governance yeah. um shift um yeah. as we go up and down and did you see that change um when we go beyond let's say the state level so you talked yeah. about the local and you talked about the state but there's <coughs> a lot now that you know there's reconceptualization at kind of the national imagination of what it means to resituate respond mm-hmm. to a climate disaster like right. even today that the you know when the, the floods in pakistan too yeah. where you know there's this there's a call for reparations yeah. um and i'm just i mean i know these are two yeah. kind of just big questions but but i just want to know what you yeah. what you thought about yeah thanks about that. thanks um anandita like um so you know what's interesting in this quite say unlike say the pakistan floods or um or some of the other bigger disasters even in uttarakhand right where there is a when which you can attribute this to climate change and there will be studies that will come out and say that you know 80% chances have increased because of climate change that are heat waves or this floods are we are 50% sure that you know it has increased this by whatever there are all these ways in which you can attribute it to climate change but something like with big cats or bears that are behaving inexplicably there isn't really a similar kind of modeling system that you have uh available though you know increasingly the world wildlife fund etc will be talking about how human animal conflict a term that i hate but one has to use it is increasing because of climate change there is um more and more you'll see articles in science etc or in these wildlife biology journals talking about uh in huge spikes in conflict because of climate change and then they show the causality but the the bigger thing is also mired within a older colonial discourse of you know jim corbett and hunting and shikar stories and it's it, in a romanticized understanding also of india's this place of tigers and leopards etc um so i think that shifts that makes it quite different from say when i talk about the kedarnath disaster or you know where 
at different scales of the bureaucracy, they're quite, they will quite easily talk about climate change in that sense, where they'll be like, you know, yes, the glaciers are disappearing, and hence this has led to it, and there was unseasonal monsoon rain, and hence these disasters are happening. With the big cats, what happens is that you do have, in a way, more localized bureaucrats talking about climate change. And to be honest, they're normally doing it to depoliticize it, to say, hum kya kare? we can't do anything about it. You know, this is climate change, and they're acting in funny ways. And I remember the first time I heard the climate change um, narrative was actually back in 2007 from a local forest, a DFO, basically a divisional forest officer, who said, um, you know, this is happening more in the winters than in the summers, and the reason this is happening is because these leopards are coming down, it's too hot for them now, uh, because it's not cold enough in the upper Himalayas, it's not snowing enough or whatever, and they come down and they have no prey because of climate change and extinction, and they turn on humans. So, uh, but I don't really see this actually, I'd say the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, they, I, at that level, in Delhi, etc., I haven't come across this narrative myself. Uh, but again, I haven't actually done that much work with them at that level. Uh, I've very much worked more locally in Uttarakhand. And what I found interesting there is that um, climate change is used quite strategically. It's used at points to actually, for the state to avoid responsibility. To, because, you know, it's so easy then, right? It's an ultimate depoliticization tool saying, it's climate change, what do we do? We are just some, you know, pen-pushing bureaucrats sitting here. We can't do anything about it. Um, so it's it's very interesting uh, to see that. So th and at the international level, I think there is more and more uh, argument um, about climate change leading to human-animal conflict. So it's very acceptable, but these kind of direct like uh, kind of attributions, the way that say you're having for flooding or other kinds, or like hurricanes, or ex other extreme events is not there quite yet. You know, I remember when I sent my book out for review, one of the reviewers I have, I mean, again, you know, reviewer two, was like, um, was like basically, this has nothing to do with, like, what is, she, what is she talking about? Climate change, Anthropocene, what is all this? Like, there's nothing to do with that. India's always had man -eaters. And I was like, oh my God, like, you know, how do I like, so I mean, you're basically undoing the entire premise of the work, you know, you know, and uh, I mean, anyway, thankfully the other reviewers didn't think that. Um, but I, I find it fascinating because this was like four years back and then of course it went through many iterations and I just don't see anyone being able to make that argument now because I think even in such a short time, it is, even within academic spaces, it, becomes, it is becoming harder and harder to say this has nothing to do with climate change, right? But even four years back, a, a reviewer, an academic reviewer could come out and say, this has nothing to do with that. India's always had man-eating tigers. I was like, oh my God, who is this person? Like, what is this, right? Um, so I think it's also, again, like, it's also an interesting moment for us where I don't feel like I have to fight this argument that much. People take it, accept it in ways that they didn't. Right? Even though the argument has not changed for a few years, I mean, this, this has been something that's been quite evident in the Himalaya in a way uh, for a while. So, yeah. So, anyway, I'm sorry, rambling answer to like climate change and scale shifting, but yeah. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so, I think I for uh, today's talk. I, I really, really enjoyed uh, your use of beastly tales. Thank you. Uh, and I think it's it's so important to to think through forms of storytelling story of, as ways of kind of rendering ecologies of experience in ways that exactly. I think specifically anthropology as a discipline has right. an ability to, to do. Yeah. Um, and I think what was most exciting for me in your use of beastly tales is that it kind of gives us a new way of thinking through the role of the mythological right. as the site right. in which yeah. um, the scales of the everyday and the scale of the global problem, say, of climate change becomes visible, right. um, but within the kind of realm of, of fiction. Right. Um, and, and I think your use of beastly tales kind of directs us to um, a new sort of relation between the mythical and the moral, because I think what both Vikram Seth and you do is to turn the fable on its head mm -hmm. in the sense that the animal or the non-human stops being this kind of metaphor or symptom of a human problem, but mm -hmm. instead turns into a kind of agonistic presence mm -hmm. via whom you're able to express, say, to the bureaucratic institution or to the state uh, a form of resistance, for example, mm -hmm. because while you're able to kind of turn the, the, the problem into a story in which you kind of express, you're able to express, as you say, forms of doubt and uncertainty. Uh, you also have the simultaneous way of acknowledging that this is a kind of co-species uh, who is also fighting to, 
to feed itself. Right. Um, so I was wondering if you would say a little bit more about how the category of the moral in relation mm. to the human animal kind of changes in this kind of aesthetic form of the the tail as mm. opposed to myth. Yeah, thank you so much. What a lovely like question and so beautifully put. I mean, you put it much more beautifully than uh, you know <laughs> I would have with the with the use of um, the category of the beastly tail. I mean, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really nice way to read it because I, I, the way I think of these stories or beastly tales, as I prefer, is and I think I turn to beastly tales because um, initially I turn to them because I mean I love Vikram Seth's work and you know reading this was just it's something that has been influential. But also because I think I read in the way that you did that it didn't become a myth, but it became a way to see um, unexpected relationships, which then have a moral to them without you know but but also in a really like quirk in, in his book like the quirky they're like they're not between animals you would think of necessarily and the spin on it is so interesting um in the sort of my interviews and ethnographic work i think what i found really interesting and really compelling was once one was the density of the narratives right like these there wasn't a simple straightforward story ever there were like different ones there were different narratives they were very dense um it took me a long time to sort of make sense of them. And, you know, I guess that is, if you do field work in one area for a long time, you do get 10 stories, whatever your topic, whatever your subject. But I, I think from, I found them particularly dense because there were so many things that they were trying to bring together. Uh, or, uh, to my mind, they bring together. Or, again, maybe I was reading them, but I think, I think that they were trying to bring them together. And I found that how do I write about them? How do I explain them to people who don't know the context, who don't know the language, who don't know, you know? And I found the category of beastly tale really useful for that because it allows you to pose certain questions like who's the beast of the tale? It allows you to also talk about uh, these animals as, again, in an anthropomorphized way, as having their own moral systems that they work under or their own compunctions that they're living under, um, their own agency for sure but their own um their own relationships to one another to humans to the environment that they live in to the planet that they inhabit uh so so that's so yeah so that was the way i sort of i read it but yeah thank you for your very beautiful comment and and the reading of it Thank you so much for this talk. This gave me a lot to think with, and I don't think I'm asking you a question about scale, but I might be. So <laughs> this be the whole talk, talk on scale, yeah. <laughs> but I want to talk a little bit about the Anthropocene. I was really struck, and I appreciate when scholars um, sort of name their own kind of ambivalence or hesitance right. yeah. to adopt certain terms or kind of adopt terms and then throw them away. And I was struck by the, towards the end of the talk, where you sort of name the Anthropocene as um, human mastery over nature. Mm -hmm. And the reason I think um, this word jumps out to me is because on the one hand, right, the literature on the Anthropocene is very much about collapsing distinctions. It's right. about universality in a way, right? If you want to read the sort of the Chakrabarti's work, right, it's about the mm -hmm. collapsing of disciplines, the collapsing of, different, mm -hmm. of, of difference, literally, in yeah. some ways. Yeah. Um, and yet, I'm struck by the examples that you sort of offer mm -hmm. in the talk, which are about unevenness mm -hmm. and about difference, right? Mm -hmm. The folks who are experiencing the brunt of climate change yeah. are the folks who have been sort of dispossessed from power for the last X number of centuries. And so yeah. I wonder how your project might be asking us to think about this category of difference, mm -hmm. be it racial, mm -hmm. gender, caste, class, mm -hmm. etc., alongside the use of the term Anthropocene, because mm -hmm. I think to, again, this is where I'm like, I might be skirting around this word scale, <laughs> because I think to some extent, right, you're giving us this provocation that is, how do we think about the universal problem mm -hmm. of the climate mm -hmm. in the very particular, and here I use the word different, right, yeah. um, sort of manifestations of climate mm -hmm. change. And, and the reason why I'm asking this question is because in part, it seems connected right. to this other provocation you have, which is, um, uh, who produces good anthropology mm. and in my head my question was what is good anthropology yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think if you think about the legacies of mm. the discipline right as you're thinking about this mm -hmm. project it seems mm. that part of the the good in anthropology is also tied to how anthropology deals 
with the problem of difference. Yeah, right. Thank you. Fantastic. Wonderful comment again. Um, so I should say the good anthropology was in quotes. I should have done this care quotes like, you know, as a sarcastic uh, thing of what is good and who defines what the good is exactly right. Yeah. Um, you know, again, that's a really, um, really wonderful creative way to think about it. That actually, um, I think I haven't thought about difference enough. I think I've ta- thought, thought about inequality here and I've thought about scale a bit in terms of the different scales of it existing. But one way to really think about it, um, especially as I go forward with thinking about its implications for method, might be as a collapsing of difference, as you said, right? Of, or like, or, or the accentuation of certain forms of differences. So I think the latter is something that I have thought a lot about. And in a way, this project also comes from a sense of rage that, you know, you feel when you go there and you just, it's exactly as you said, that people who have had absolutely nothing to contribute to this are bearing the brunt in absolutely horrific ways. And they're invisibilized, they are just... Um, you know, these ghost villages and like the kinds of stories behind each of the ghost villages of why people are abandoning them and leaving and the kind of horrific situations they're living in on the plains, unemployment, complete displacement, etc. There's that everyday mundane form of what the climate crisis is doing. Mm-hmm. Of course, you have the spectacular disasters, you have the floods, you have the other things which are also horrific in their own ways. Um, so the, in a way, this project is birthed out of this anger at the inequality which is intrinsic in it. and the deep injustice at the very heart of the climate crisis um, where you know the people as you're saying the ones who are most vulnerable the most like different in terms of position class caste race gender etc the ones who are least equipped to uh, least equipped to deal with it or to find ways to adapt uh, you know that again a thing I hate the whole climate adaptation narrative around it um, but yeah um, I think your question is uh, I don't think it's nicely on scale. I think it's a really interesting question on thinking about difference um, within it. And I have to say, I have not thought of it that way, but this could be really useful for me uh, as I go forward, thinking about, especially about methodological difference, right? Because again, that is something I keep coming back to and I've not done enough with, which is that how do you collapse these distinctions between different disciplines, like between climate science and ethnography or between poetry and geography? Like, you know, how do we... Um, maybe not collapse the differences, but how do we make them speak to one another in some form? Or, you know, how do we translate these forms of knowledge just across domains? Uh, because I think we do need to do that if we want to understand what life and death in the Anthropocene consists of. So, yeah, but thank you. That was a really wonderful comment again. Oh. Thank you so much for your talk. Yeah, it was related to what was just asked. So. Um, I study geology and climate science, and so I find that a lot of times, I take a lot of anthropology and sociology classes, that it's treated as two separate things. Yeah. Like, that's the climate science, that's the IPCC, that's going to inform the policy, and a lot of the, the peers that I work with are very, from the geology side, are a bit, I wouldn't say ignorant but are just uninformed completely about the people and i find that sometimes like you know how people are affected by climate change should inform the science too but it's always science informing people so and you said you work with geologists so i was wondering like what do you think we can do to challenge that Mm -hmm. from the more like geology science side Mm -hmm. that has been informed in a very certain way that builds a very one type of narrative and what we can do to change that as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, great question and something, again, I've been struggling with for a while. So for the last three years at Cambridge, I've been part of this research network, which is called Climate, um, at Oxford, sorry, which is called Climate Crisis Thinking in the Humanities and Social Sciences. And our project is trying to do this. It's trying to get natural scientists, humanities scholars, and social scientists to sit on the same table, so to say, and discuss climate change and try to work together and it's been absolutely impossible. It's such an uphill task, right? Because as you're saying, like the scientists have one way of understanding it and the humanities scholars also resist, resist in their own way. And so the social scientists and I mean, I don't know. I mean, I feel like I'm, I feel exactly as you, as you know, as you're describing it. We've tried to co-write, we've tried to, you know, talk about this need for sort of translation across um, disciplines, but it seems incredibly hard to do. and. And exactly as you're saying, it's really problematic because, you know, the science needs to be informed by other 
knowledge forms and I also think, um, for instance, as an anthropologist, that we need to read a bit more of geology. And, uh, you know, I've learned a lot from speaking to geologists and glaciologists. I've just understood a lot of things that I didn't earlier. And I think we need to do that kind of work, but it's also incredibly hard to do. Um, so yeah, I have absolutely no answer other than to say that I'm, I feel exactly the same on the same very, you know, rough, choppy terrain of struggle around this. So, unless anyone else has a question, I just want to have like one yeah, tiny follow-up question, please. right? Like, yeah. so <laughs> it's about the ghost towns. Yeah. So, I mean, ghost villages. Sorry. Mm. So, I mean, um, I mean, we have this narrative of like ghost towns mm. in the U.S., right? Like mm. in post-industrial derelict, where people like right. just essentially fl fled these like spaces right. because of the urban decay, etc. But here. I mean, I, I actually want to know a little bit more about yeah. why they were abandoned. Yeah. And also, I mean, the juxtaposition of these, like, this forms of slow everyday violence with the kind of, like, episodic mm. hazards that are, like, environmental right. hazards that we kind of, like, you know, uh, in the in the Kedarnath flooding, etc., yeah. we see, yeah. right? So there is, a, there is a juxtaposition in which we kind of, like, actually see the difference between the ways in which climate change is actually impacting this yeah. region. But like, um, in in this story, I, I also kind of like, I mean, following up from Brian, I just want to kind of also say that like, there is the, there is like a sense of othering that is going on in, mm -hmm. in, in the narratives of the villages as well, right? Like he, right. the, the plains people are sending up yeah. the, the, you know, the, the, the old animals and mm -hmm. like you know who who are not acquainted with living in the mountains etc yeah so there is that division in between us and them yeah and i kind of wanted to kind of like you know help i i want to kind of think through that I yeah. ideation so like why do you think that is and mm -hmm. like how does that kind of like relate to the villages that are being abandoned mm -hmm. i mean who are in all possibility actually like you know moving over to the plains as well so yeah. just that kind of yeah 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 no I mean so you know that's um Sangeeta, there's a long history to the plains and um mountain sort of animosity where and very rightly so where they talk about how people from the plains have stolen the resources and you know dammed the rivers for electricity in the cities or cut down timbers you know for like things which are happening downstream etc and just also genuinely like the the political ways in which uh, the state has been governed so Uttarakhand as you know was formed as a state was carved out of Uttar Pradesh and there was this whole um argument which was made by one argument that was made was that they want their own kind of specific development which is a mountain development though of course as people like Emma Maudsley have shown that actually what was happening was that this was an anti-reservation backlash right by because of the caste um, composition of the mountains in her very wonderful work on the creation of Uttarakhand. Um, so uh, the ghost villages, like the reasons, you know, if you, if you were to go, I mean, if I when I go and talk to people, they'll say it's unemployment. It's you know, it is. There is nothing here. The younger generation doesn't want to live there anymore. They want to go and live in the plains, and they want to. They don't necessarily have the same relationship to the mountains, or the same history with it that others do. Um, they talk about how there this absence of any kind of class progression. You know, any aspirations to a middle class life is not possible there. You can't go to the cinema. You don't have, you know, proper roads, etc. Things like that. Um, but they will also talk about, uh, quite, you know, things like the leopards that are entering, or the fact that wild boars are attacking their their farmsteads, etc. Um, and you know, again, they won't make direct attributions to climate change uh, or to like things that are associated with it. They won't say that because of climate change we're leaving. Uh, but they will name this, this, this together, which to me, in my interpretation, and I might be completely wrong, but I would read them as part of the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 I want to read them as part of that because I think I, I can't write them out, though I'm happy to be, you know, to be told I'm wrong on that. And, you know, that's fine. That's my interpretation. Um, so uh, that and then, you know, what I find, again, interesting is that the big disasters, 
of course they talk about them as horrific and you know in some cases they're life changing right because your village is swept off then obviously that's the end but i think in the big disasters there is a way in which there is there is this whole language of apatha or of disaster in the mountains where you have them in a seasonal way so when you have the monsoons there's some sort of apatha that a disaster that happens etc they do talk about them and i won't say that you know they're not important but actually it's these everyday struggles of not getting water not getting electricity of being scared to go into the fields because of the monkeys because of the wild boar because of the leopards because of the bears uh, it's it's that kind of change in in the daily life that that they really talk a lot about but again you know i think the question you're sort of asking the broader question that's a really important one Uh, which has you know is that what is what is leading to these forms of abandonment mm. and i think it would be wrong to point to just one thing or two things i think there are a spate of things happening together um and you know and which which have, ha- has led to this uh and i need to i need to study them more because i you know i don't think i've studied ghost villages as deeply as i should have yeah it's like the birds migrating you know when there is a dis- like a disaster essentially yeah yeah Again, really great question. You know, I think this question of climate justice and environmental justice is finally gaining ground in in the mountains in a way that I hadn't necessarily seen during the time I'd worked there earlier. So I believe that during the time of the Chipko movement, that um, you know, the 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 movement to protect the trees, there was a very strong narrative around environmental justice, what we would term environmental justice now. um but it was very much about resources and like resource extraction and stopping that and leaving the resources with the people who actually live in in the local area um but awfully there is a much more of a talk around questions of climate justice which again is coming in through particular kinds of external experts so through ngos through you know academics um and i think that's doing some interesting political work in terms of allying of pushing back against the capacity of of the bureaucratic use of climate change to depoliticize because i don't i mean my earlier you know when i would see this this use of climate change it was very much to depoliticize it was a way for the local state to say we can't do anything about it you know this is like a global problem it's happening everywhere the himalayas are dying and collapsing and we can't do anything about it so it was very much a way to abdicate responsibility but of late what is becoming more and more interesting to me is to see that there's a discourse on climate change that also local politicians are picking up politically they're not doing it to uh, lead to the depoliticization but to say that we need some form of action in the himalaya that wasn't there earlier we were discussing this in the context of uh, of mumbai as well where uh, you know a shiv sena government uh, certain you know members of the thakre family are very invested in climate change and it is having very real political impacts right like within local states within ngos etc um what these are i have not myself traced uh, i haven't done that ethnographic labor of tracing uh, what the impact is but i think it's changing that terrain around it you know which again goes to show that 
uh, these expert, expert discourses that come from, that might come from outside, might be couched in a different language, actually go on to have very important political effects in places, and it's important to understand what they are. They don't always need to be um, progressive, but they, they upset the field in one form or the other, and they allow for uh, other kinds of contestations or claims to be made, uh, which is really important in this moment, I think, because we, we need a new vocabulary to talk about. Uh, the scale of injustice um, and the scale of um, of damage and you know and just the, the, the sort of the horrors of everyday life we literally need a new language to be able to talk about it so yeah. yes <laughs> Right. Yeah. And they have any emotions. It's displaced in the migration and unemployment, poverty, family. Right. Yeah. And as you know, some of the discourse around floods is also like that. Yeah. Pakistan, yeah. You have a debt crisis. No. The island or the island, even if you know floods. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And it's real. I mean, there's a. Right. Um, great, uh, great questions again, Zara. So, I mean, I think the first one on crisis, um, and again, as you know, that you know, there's been um, one way to think about crisis, and again, this was, I think, very much my initial take on the whole crisis narrative is that you can say we're always in crisis, and everything is a crisis, and especially in the Himalayas, there's a very long-standing narrative of environmental crisis, which in a way is also true of certain kinds of states which are always perpetually in crisis, or certain places are thought to always have some form of crisis, right? Economic crisis, ecological crisis. There's a very long history of this understanding of the Himalayas always dying and collapsing. So in a way that, you know, um, I, and there's a critical, again, as you know, a critical anthropological take on what crisis does, what are the political uses it's put to, is it really a crisis, um, the power of naming something as a crisis, you know, what are the choices we're making when we say it's climate crisis instead of something else. Um, and I, I've, I've sort of thought a lot with that work and thought a lot about the kind of naming practices I'm adopting or the framing that I'm using here. Um, and. I have struggled with it, gone back and forth, and been like, for instance, is climate crisis the right word? Is the Anthropocene the right framing, right? And I find them both inadequate, but I find them also compelling enough to be able to name a particular reality that I think needs to be named. Uh, and I think this is a thing that, as anthropologists, we always face, right? Or as social scientists, as people who do field work, or you don't even have to do field work. I think as just someone who's trying to describe a social world, right? That how, how do you describe it? What frames are you using? What things are you naming? How, how do you term it that? Um, and I, I always struggle with it. And I'm not sure even after, you know, the book is published, whether this is the right way to do it. But I think it is the best of the options available. It is the best vocabulary that's there. I also think that there is something within the climate crisis thing and the Anthropocene frame that allows for a politicization of this moment and allows for us to 
center the deep damage that has been done by humans on the planet, just like put it front and center, which I think needs to be done. Um, and so for instance, and I thought in this book in particular, I felt like it needed to be done because there's a lot of work on multi-species ethnography, on the post-human, on the non-human, etc. cetera, um, you know, which is wonderful and really rich and beautiful. But I am a bit uh, disgruntled with how it doesn't actually work at this planetary level, how it doesn't, se like you don't really have a climate crisis in it, right? These become very localized, or historical relationships between humans and non-humans that are there. And I think those are very important and I learn a lot from, I've learned a lot from these, you know, this wonderful work which in South Asia on, on the non-human. But I, I am, I can't, I cannot imagine talking about these big cats outside the climate crisis. And I think to do so uh, would be a form of violence. It would be a form of writing out that which is really important to center. Um, at the same time, I'm also very conscious of the fact that the term crisis is used very loosely. It can be used in other ways. Does climate crisis really capture it? I don't know. But I think it's the best possible frame, you know? Um, so I think that's why, that's how I think of it. On the ontological turn, um, again, like, I'm, I'm not a big fan <laughs> of it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, and I haven't found it um, necessarily very productive for the kind of uh, ethnographic work I have. And now I don't know whether this is because, you know, South Asia is very different from the Amazon. I don't know whether it is that my interests are very different from what's happening in other parts of the world. Um, I just haven't, I have to say I've sidestepped it because I, I, I find that it, to deal with, with that kind of literature, which is very different from my work, would just take up too much space and energy for me because I don't find it relevant in a way for what I'm doing. You know, I'd rather like deal with what geologists are saying or like with what a wildlife biologist has to say about big cat, you know, biology um, because I find that more pertinent. But that could be this project, you know, our projects also shift and, and yeah. And again, these are choices. Like in a way, your, your question, your, both your questions are so interesting because they are about the kind of choices we make uh, the choices we have to make as anthropologists, with what tools do we work, what frames do we use, and why do we use these and not others? Um, and my answer to that is always that I think we should use the terms and theories and concepts and frames that we think do most justice to ethnographic work, to that which, you know, uh, and I think that's what I've tried to do. But again, as you said, you know, I think we should all also be open to revising and discarding concepts or because you know I go back and we were discussing this again with my earlier work on the bureaucracy and the state and you know I think there are so many ways we were discussing actually with Anandita there are ways in which I might have written it differently now right so because times also change you look at things differently but yeah um, it is what it is <laughs> as we say <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect ending. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here and thank you all for these wonderful comments and questions. I've just, they were wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. <laughs>